Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Lorden. I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, and this is our first uh, recess uh, briefing of the year. So thanks for coming. And this will be one hour really quick um, on the issue of Internet drones. Um, I have a bit of housekeeping. Today, our hashtag for the event, if you want to follow on Twitter, is uh, pound Internet drones. And keep that in mind in case we'll publish the video and the audio podcast. Um, after the event on that particular hashtag. And then you can also you know, follow on the conversation if you'd like. Um, our, our account is at NetCaucusAC, and that's our Twitter account, at NetCaucusAC, so you can follow us. Um, this event is hosted in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus and its co-chairs. And on the House side, that's Congressman Bob Goodlatte and Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. And on the Senate side, the co-chairs of the Internet Caucus are Senators John Thune and Senator Patrick Leahy. Um, we're thrilled that they support this program since, you know, we don't take positions on anything, but we hash out pretty much every issue. And frankly, the co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus actually agree on very little when it comes to policy, but we're really thrilled that they actually allow us to host this program that hashes out all the different issues um, in a kind of a fear dealing type of way. Um, today, our moderator is going to be Brian Fung, and he's from the Washington Post. He blogs on the switch, and on Tuesday at noon, he does um, a live chat where you can go on uh, with for, and ask him and his fellow uh, tech reporters at the Washington Post any, any question you want, no matter how ridiculous. So um, he also published a story today on Internet drones or drones um, in wildfires, and maybe you can talk about that as well. Um, that is pretty much all the housekeeping I have. We'll fin probably pick up our briefings um, in the fall. And if you had told me years ago when I started this job that I would do a briefing on drones and the Internet, I would be, I think you'd crazy. And I think in the fall we'll have uh, a briefing on robots. Uh, so uh, keep an eye out for that one. And um, I'm going to hand it off to Brian. Thanks, Tim. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a really exciting conversation. Um, definitely hoping to get a lot of questions from you guys uh, as you, know, you guys are trying to learn more about what's going on in the drone space. But I think first what we're going to try and do is um, uh, watch a video that uh, Paul here has provided us. Um, and then I'm going to have the uh, panelists introduce themselves really briefly, and then we'll jump into the meat of the, of the discussion. Cool. Um, so I think the video is showing over there. So what you just saw, in case you're not familiar, is uh, Amazon's um, program to bring, bring you your goods uh, that you've ordered from Amazon uh, in half an hour or less via drone. Um, the program is called Prime Air. And uh, I guess before we jump into that, um, just wanted to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, and then we can um, uh, turn back to some questions. Paul. Thanks, Ryan. Um, the one thing you need to know about me is I've been in the same job for 15 and a half years, a span over which I think Michael has had seven or eight jobs, <laughs> and uh, I've hired him for several of those. I'm, I, by the way, I'm Amazon's Vice President for Global Public Policy. Hi. Hey, everyone. Lisa Elman. I'm currently at Hogan Levels, where I lead our global UAS unmanned aircraft systems practice group. Um, and previously, I was working in the federal government. I worked for the Obama administration for many years and most recently ran domestic drones policy at the Department of Justice. Um, hi, Michael Droback. Um, I'm with uh, Aiken Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld. But uh, more importantly for this uh, conversation, I'm, with, I'm the executive director of the Small UAV Coalition. Uh, which is uh, gratuitous plug, www.smalluavcoalition.org. 
Uh, we represent um, the uh, the both the manufacturers, the uh, the uh, software and hardware producers, the accessory companies, um, a whole host of industry players in this field. So we have we're 30 members strong, um, and you know some of the the members. And w welcome to John Resnick, who just showed up from DJI. Uh, we've got Verizon here, um, uh, Intel, Google X, Amazon Prime Air, GoPro, Airware, uh, Drone Deploy. Uh, the companies are doing things that are just so exciting. So that's the that's the coalition. So uh, I'm about to ask the most important question of the day. Uh, I'm going to ask Paul, uh, when can I get my toothpaste delivered by drone? <laughs> well, Brian, it's going to depend a lot where you live around the world. It will be sooner in some places than in others. Uh, the challenge for us here in the United States is to try to make it here first. Um, we're a little bit behind, but we can talk about how we can get back uh, in the lead. Lisa, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was just going to say that. Uh, so as is so often the case, unfortunately, the technology in this area has moved so much quicker than the policymaking. And where um, you have the technology uh, in the drone technology itself has improved exponentially over the past few years such that drones are cheaper, more mobile, and uh, more useful to industry than ever before um, at the same time as we see improvements in information technology. And so uh, there's been a huge um, demand across the board. Hobbyists' uh, use of drones, of course, has been broadly authorized for many years, many decades. And uh, but now com companies such as Amazon and many others can't wait to be able to use drone technology here in the United States to enhance their safety and efficiency. And there are so many benefits, um, but the policymaking has dragged behind. Uh, as Paul said, hopefully that will change here uh, in the next few years, in including with your, your help here in this room. Um, but uh, we, will, we, we have started to see a lot of improvements over the past several months here in the United States and hope to see additional improvements very soon. So, uh, Paul, could you just sort of uh, walk us through some of the latest on Prime Air and what we can expect in the next few months? I you know, think the last time I checked, uh, Amazon had been working on its, uh, I think it was the eighth or ninth uh, revision to its, its drone. What, you know, what goes into a design like that, and, um, and where is it going to go? Thanks, Ryan. There are a lot of technological challenges that need to be overcome. Uh, we're working on them. The technology is de developing very quickly. Uh, we've got a team of uh, roboticists, engineers, a former NASA astronaut. Uh, I've got a guy on my team who's had a 7,000-hour pilot, uh, military and commercial. Uh, so the, the, the effort is, is, uh, is a big one, uh, but the technology is pr uh, producing great results already. We're very pleased with the testing we've been able to conduct now in the United States and also elsewhere around the world. Uh, the R&D efforts are, um, are bearing fruit. And uh, so the technology is there. Now we have to get the, uh, the regulatory regime in place. Um, and we're looking to the folks in this room for help there. Um, we have a, a significant challenge, but not an insurmountable one. And so we're, uh, uh, we're going to talk about that, I'm sure, later today. Michael. Uh, so I concur with the, the discussion that, uh, that the technology is there and that it's time for us to act. And the reality is that I don't think anyone in this on this panel is um, uh, I don't think anyone will uh, would disagree that uh, everyone in the industry that we speak to on the coalition and friends of the coalition want to do this uh, and operate and execute safely and within the expectation of consumer privacy. So, you know, if you're doing something safely and you're doing it uh, with the respect for for the consumer and the customer. Um, I think there should be um, a little more latitude given. And I think one of the things that we've been calling for right at the outset as a small UAV coalition is an, uh, an incremental approach, which is let us not hold up the micro UAS uh, because we're trying to come up with something that will solve all of these problems. I think what we're going to see is you'll see a trajectory that's going to be just beautiful, which is you'll see areas and certain vehicles that can be used for, uh, you know, a panoply of different services and uh, purposes that can be online right away and that can be done so safely. And then you'll see operations where you're getting your toothpaste. Now, I, I would encourage you to get it. Um, and because, you know, I've been speaking with you already, and so getting some toothpaste via drone be would be great. But the point is it's going to take a trajectory where we are acknowledge that we have a micro UAS rule, and then we're up into, uh, into operations that are just going to uh, really blow the mind. Um, so with that in mind, what, you know, we've talked a bit about uh, the delivery of goods and services via drone, but, um, you know, what kinds of applications, other applications are there that really excite you? 
Well, um, thanks, Brian. So I would just add to the package delivery um, just to say that I think that drones are completely going to transform our economy uh, in industries across the board. And every industry that doesn't realize that they have a, a use for drone technology now will down the road, kind of like cell phones. When cell phones were first invented, we never imagined all of the different apps and uses that would come out of that technology. Um, so we're seeing precision agriculture, for example, is going to be a huge one where uh, crop dusting and plant inspection is going to be made much more um, safe and much more efficient. Um, keeping critical infrastructure inspection um, safe and effective flare stack inspection, for example, cell tower inspection, pipeline inspection, being able to travel hundreds of miles um, to examine pipelines. Uh, drones will be able to do that very um, in, with additional safety. The first to get approvals through the 333 exemption proce process, which we'll talk about, um, were the filmmakers. And it makes a whole lot of sense that using a drone rather than a helicopter on a film set to film a movie um, is a lot safer in case of an accident or in case something were to go wrong. Um, you have a few thousand pounds helicopter versus a, a small drone um, and is just as effective. And so in countless, um, in countless industries across the board, we're going to see the use for drone technology um, making itself clear and uh, we already see that in the range of industries that are already applying to be able to fly under the 333 exemption process, which we have m well over 2,000 companies that have uh, already applied for the ability to fly and uh, close to 1,000 authorizations as of this morning. Uh, so I would, I mean, I, I dispute nothing that was just said about the industries this is going to impact, and I would say it's going to be uh, ubiquitous across every sector of the economy. The, uh, the FAA, or excuse me, the uh, Department of Transportation, in its own analysis of its NPRM, said that this was going to impact 300 or more sectors of the economy, um, and it went on and on. And um, I think it's easy to look at some of the industries, like the, the close-up filmmaking, where and say, oh, it's going to be amazing, and we, rep we represent companies that are in that space, so it's great. But we're also talking about, and I haven't read your article yet, but I will. Um, we're also talking about what I think is going to be probably one of the most important parts of this, beyond package delivery, of course, Paul, um, and that is um, search and rescue, um, you know, disaster management. Being able to, so we're, there's a big discussion about the fact that there are hobbyists and recreational users who are interfering with first responders. Well, that's against the law, period. It's already against the law. And yet we're seeing all these state laws come up that say, we've got a mandate that this can't happen. Okay, well, if you want to make redundant laws, let's make them. That's fine. But it's against the law to do what they were doing. And the reality is, I think I'd rather have uh, the, I was on a panel with the sheriff of Menlo, uh, excuse me, the fire chief of Menlo Park who said, we own one, we just can't use it. And we want to. We want to send it in beforehand so we don't have to send some people into dangerous situations. So I'm looking at the industry in terms of what can we do for the humanitarian part of this. And, for example, um, you know, DJI and, uh, you know, Linking the World just met. Linking the World is a humanitarian organization that works with disaster management both domestically and internationally. And the conversation was, you know, we, they have a pro pro project called Halo. And it's how can we use drones to bring pharmaceuticals, to bring uh, food, food sources, to bring things to communities that are otherwise unserved. And I'm sure everyone saw over the weekend where Facebook is saying they're going to be at 60 to, 60 to 90,000 feet with a, a massive drone that's going to provide incredible Internet access to the 10 percent of the, the world's community that isn't served. So right now we're talking about things that are going to make consumers' lives better and help them. So that's a part of it that's very compelling. The commercial aspect of it's also uh, thrilling. But I, I just think we need to know that the scope of this is far beyond just a commercial interest. Uh, it's, it, it has to do with being able to harness the power of technology to help people. And so to, um, to go back to what Lisa was just saying, you know, a lot of companies and a lot of um, organizations have been trying uh, to use, use drones for their um, own operations, but they've been kind of held up um, by uh, a slow regulatory process. Can you sort of describe, um, you know, there's this Section 333 exemption process. For folks who don't know, um, you know, this is a, a way for um, interested parties who want to be able to use drones um, to ask the FAA for special permission um, to test them under, you know, and, and use them under a sort of set of limited circumstances. But, um, Lisa, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, uh, the exemption process and how that's been going. Sure. Great. Thanks, Brian. So just to take a step back, you it's, you're currently unauthorized to use drones commercially here in the United States. It's an intent test. So if I want to 
fly my drone in a park with my family. Um, that's completely, as long as I'm in not restricted airspace, not endangering anyone as a hobbyist, that is totally fine. If I want to do that same flight and then sell those photos for $10 each because they're such great photos, that is an illegal flight. That is um, currently unauthorized by the FAA. Commercial activity is not yet broadly authorized. Hobbyist activity is. Um, in, in 2012, Congress uh, mandated that the federal government integrate drones into our domestic airspace. And the federal government was a bit slow moving to that process, but we've seen some action on that front in, um, in recent months. And on February 15th, the, uh, uh, the FAA released its notice of proposed rulemaking, which will broadly authorize commercial use of UAS here in the United States. Now, until that rule is final, which could be end of this year, perhaps next year, perhaps the next year, we don't know, um, we ha you have to get special license from the FAA in order to be able to fly commercially. And um, there's a number of ways to do so. Many of them are very burdensome. The 333 exemption process was a way that the FAA devised um, coming from Section 333 of the law that would allow in the short term low-risk commercial operations here in the United States states. And you're essentially saying, you know, I understand under current law that a drone is an aircraft. I will abide by the federal aviation regulations. They don't make any sense as applied to drones. Um, and here's how I will operate with an equivalent level of safety. Um, it is uh, somewhat of a burdensome process. Some of the rules don't make a whole lot of sense. For example, you have to have a manned aircraft pilot's license in order to fly under a 333 exemption. But nevertheless, over the last few months, we have seen the process streamlined and, um, and quickened so that we're getting a lot more folks' uh, permission to fly, which is an improvement. Um, but it is a Band-Aid solution until we have a final rule. Um, but as of this morning, um, there are approximately 1,000 authorizations. Um, so we do have folks that are being approved to fly here in the U.S. Michael? Yeah, I would just like to, to – I mean, obviously the, the, the process within the Section 333 – um, is a little convoluted, and again, a lot of the same devices are coming before the same people to be approved over and over again, and they know the devices, and so we're not, we're just reinventing the wheel. It seems like a waste of time. Um, the one thing I would not dispute with, but I think I would raise as a concern for everyone in this room is that the idea that the final rule is going to allow for broad use of uh, the devices in the future, um, in my view, is a complete fallacy. Um, the rule is um, uh, imperfect, to say the least which is you're not op able to operate at night, which is uh, critical for many purposes. You're not going to be able to be operate beyond visual line of sight. You're not going to be able to operate um, over people unassociated with the project. So if you, if, you, if you listen to that, that's a really interesting part of this. So in the DOT's analysis of their own NPRM, they said that between 2004 and 2012, 95 fatalities uh, uh, occurred because of cell tower inspection being done manually by human beings and that each person's life could be valued at $9.2 million. I don't know where they came up with these money, the, the sums, and of course I don't put a value on life like that. But the reality is if you look at that and you're looking at this rule, where are cell towers? They're not always in random places. In fact, and oftentimes you find that the, 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 the projects that are most important are going to be done over people unassociated with the project. So we have a, a rule in place right now that we're waiting on that – doesn't really take into account what this industry is going to be. If it's going to be ubiquitous, if it's going to be uh, as revolutionary as it can be, this rule, we shouldn't be waiting for it. It was supposed to be next month that would be final. It will not be. Then some said maybe February 2016. I don't think many are holding their breaths for that. And, and again, I think we're probably talking 2017 or later. So it's going to take an act of Congress. And mind you, the FAA has already told Congress we're not going to respond to the mandate you've given us once. I think the reality is that this rule has to be broadened. We have to think micro. We have to think incremental. And then we have to allow this uh, industry to flourish the way it can. So, Paul, um, you know, as, as someone who works for a company that's gone through this process, can you sort of describe, you know, the, what it was like uh, asking the FAA for uh, Section 333 exemption? And, and then, you know, uh, to, to Michael's point, would you or would Amazon – um, you know, support a legislative effort on drones, and what what would what should go in it? Yeah, well, what Lisa and uh, and Michael have described is is, is accurate. Um, I, we had a difficult time getting permission to test our drones outdoors, um, and we were proposing to do so in a rural area of Washington State uh, on property that we were in complete control of, uh, away from people. And it just turned out it took a long time. I, th I think part of it, the, the FAA was just finding its way at the time. Uh, I think they've improved this kind of a process. 
uh, tremendously since uh, we went through it. We were one of the first ones to, to apply. Um, but this, as, uh, as Michael underlined just a moment ago, is not the end all at all. Uh, our biggest concern at this point is that we're not adequately preparing for the real uses of these drones that would be beyond visual line of sight at a great distance and operating in a highly automated way. I mean, the, the notion of having one pilot or operator per drone is, uh, it just would undermine the, uh, the capabilities of this technology, which are, uh, are, are manifest. But uh, if we're not planning for it here in the U.S., we're going to miss out on the, uh, these opportunities. Um, I, I suppose, and I'm not here to beat up the FAA. I really don't want to. Uh, what, what we're asking is that policymakers in Washington take very seriously the notion that we need to plan for the future now. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we're ready as, as a government or a nation to adopt rules today that would allow these kinds of highly automated beyond visual line of flight rules. Uh, we need to plan for it, though. We need to start planning for it right now uh, in a way that is being done elsewhere around the world. We are, Amazon is a global company, as you know, and so uh, I, I started off by saying it's not clear when we'll start offering the service simply because it's not clear where we'll be able to offer it first. We want to serve our customers globally, uh, and uh, if that's in other countries first, that's so be it. Uh, but what's happening in other countries, though, we're seeing planning for that highly automated beyond visual line of sight kind of operation. Uh, we also see something else that's uh, less apparent here in the U.S., which is taking a, what is we call a risk-based approach to regulation. Now, uh, these, these small UAVs are indeed small. They're lightweight. They don't fly very fast. And as a result, their kinetic energy is significantly less than for a manned aircraft. Uh, kinetic energy is a function of one-half mv squared. Uh, so you can see that just the mass of it is, uh, is a product, is a, is a factor in uh, determining how much kinetic energy and thus how much damage can be done in, a, in some sort of a uh, mishap. Um, so to take a risk-based approach is to acknowledge that a catastrophic failure in a uh, package delivery drone could be simply mean that the drone is disabled and falls to the ground and, you know, it knows where to fall by itself. It knows how to avoid things, but just – and then it's abandoned. Well, that's not a catastrophic failure in the same sense that a, a crash of a commercial airliner would be. Uh, and so we can't treat the regulatory regimes identically. We really need to take a truly risk-based approach. The, the FAA has, has um, suggested that it will, um, and uh, it's just the suggestions aren't quite as strong and clear as they are, for example, at uh, IASA and, and JARUS, two uh, organizations primarily in Europe. So, um, Paul, you were just sort of touching on some of the potential – liabilities or vulnerabilities associated with drones. So let's, let's pick that apart now. I mean, um, you know, there's obviously a big safety component here. What happens when, um, you know, a, a drone loses control and has to stop somewhere? Um, you know, who, who gets to, you know, who has to then take responsibility for that? Um, but also, you know, what are some of the sort of security um, concerns? You know, we've, we've been hearing lots uh, in recent weeks about um, potential hacking vulnerabilities and, um, you know, our drones, uh, you know, what kinds of things are, are we uh, putting in place to protect our drones from hackers and that kind of thing? Yeah, so safety is our top priority and is the top priority of many of the companies that are involved in this. Uh, one of the things that we've seen is the, the regulatory regime, for what for historical reasons, is sort of upside down, where right now uh, hobbyists who may or may not have any training at all or may not be particularly safety conscious are allowed to do things that companies who, by a lot of, for a lot of reasons, need to be safety conscious. Uh, as we start deploying the drones, we're very well aware of uh, concerns about about security and about risk and liability. We, we're just so focused on this, keeping these things safe um, that, um, that we're very confident that it can be done. I mean, uh, there, are, there are mitigations that we have in place already that we're developing for in all these areas. What we ought to be able to do, however, is to prove the safety of it by showing these mitigations, show how they work, and have these be allowed into a regulatory regime once we're able to do that. If we're not able to do it, if we're not able to convince policymakers that these things are safe, well, then that's, that's a problem. But we're going to be able to do it. We just need the opportunity. One of the things that I find really interesting about a, a different kind of emerging technology, which is self-driving cars, is that a uh, number of um, you know car makers like Google uh, have been sort of very transparent about, oh, you know, our self-driving car was in an accident this day, and um, you know there were no injuries, but you know here's exactly how it happened. Uh, and I think you know, has is anyone in the drone industry sort of looking at um, 
uh, increasing transparency with reports of that kind or, or of any other kind? What, what, what does that look like in the drone industry? It appears I'll be answering this question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I would say this. Um, there are a lot of discussions about what technology can be brought to bear uh, in providing just that information. And I think one of the things that I hasten to kind of um, suggest, lest this audience get the wrong impression, is that um, I own a number of drones, and one of them, for example, is a DJI um, Phantom 3. And I didn't know if I was outside of five miles in my house, and so I turned it on, and I, it was disabled. I was unable to fly it. And I was unable to fly it because it was aware of where I was, and it then disabled my use of it. So, so you know, can, for but, folks who don't really right, yeah. Can you ex explain how that system works and why it is that your drone is grounded? So it, there's a geofence, and it, it, it recognizes where I am because I'm allowing it to. So I'm using my iPad on my actual controller for my DJI Phantom 3, which is, by the way, awesome. And um, I love it. Uh, and, you know, I'm taking photos of my family when we're not within five miles of an airport. But the geofencing technology recognizes where I am, recognizes what the existing no-fly zones are, and it prohibits me from flying uh, in areas like that. So I went out, and Paul Bradner, a friend of mine here from the Internet Society, went out to his home because he's uh, uh, far enough out from airports. In fact, you're way too far out, my friend. Um, but we went out, and we flew uh, safely in areas where, you know, we had a blast. And the same is true with, you know, Parrot's products. The same is true with, uh, with 3DR's project products. Um, the other part of this is that there, you know, as we, we've seen this, is, uh, this technology is evolving, and Paul's right about this kind of risk-based approach and as well as an incremental approach, is that it's, we're not asking lawmakers or policymakers to immediately jump to kind of the, it's going to be, you know, millions of drones in one small airspace. But that's not what's being asked. I mean, I think what initially was being asked is can we test somewhere? Can, there be, can we be able to look, explore what kind of technology can, can provide the safety? But if you're unable to operate at all and if you're unable to test successfully, it's very difficult to then iterate a product. And so what's great about what's happening is that you see companies like Verizon saying, we're going to be helping on communications, command and control, lost link. We're going to, you know, and everyone's looking for answers right now. And I think the beauty of it is there's, there's really good corporate citizens saying, we'll help find them. And so you could look at, you know, RFID technology. You could look at registries. Now, a lot of that may be too much, maybe overkill. Uh, but I can tell you right now that it's um, both on the commercial and recreational front, there is so much that can be uh, gained for society that the, the, the slow pace of kind of rulemaking isn't going to get it done. And so back to your point about legislation, we do need legislation. We need it uh, this Congress. And hopefully we can work with uh, Senators Hoven and Booker on their bill and others. Uh, and just to add to what other folks are, have said, um, on the transparency point, and there are companies who realize, realizing that this was, that these public policy issues, these safety issues are paramount in order to be able to fly beyond line of sight, in order to be able to fly over people, have partnered with the federal government. So you have CNN um, in the FAA's path, what's known as the FAA Pathfinder Program. CNN partnering with the FAA to do research and development to figure out what would, what technologies are necessary in order to safely be able to have news gatherers fly in crowded cities with drones. Um, you have Precision Hawk and BNSF partnering with the FAA in order to do research and development and make all that research and development, by the way, available to the public um, on what is necessary to have drones that safely fly 300 miles in order to inspect railroads, for example, or um, for precision agriculture purposes. And so um, there are companies out there who have partnered with the federal government to do some of this research and development, make that data available to the public so to help our policymaking along. Um, because kind of as we've talked about the rulemaking, it is an iterative approach. This was just the first draft of the rule. It has a lot of work to do before we get to the point where we can take advantage of all of the many benefits, the significant safety and economic benefits that drones offer. Um, and so this was, it, it is hoped that this will provide us with some data to help get us there. So I want to come back to this public safety and geofencing issue because um, you know, I think this is one, one area where uh, it'll be really interesting to see who has the authority to set geofences. And, and you know, I can imagine a situation where uh, not just in D.C. where uh, you know, there's kind of like a permanent no-fly zone that, um, that uh, drones uh, you know, are, are obeying, 
but uh, but also, you know, in cases like uh, in California with wildfires, as we were sort of talking about earlier before the panel, um, you know, you don't you never really know when a wildfire is going to pop up. And so, you know, is that a situation where you would want a geofence up to keep drones from, uh, you know, accidentally flying in there? Um, and, and if so, you know, technologically, how does that work? And who should be responsible for inputting that into the drone's software? Um, uh, who, you know, who should be responsible? So I, I would say this. Um, I think what, you're, what we're trying to get out of this question is, how do you stop morons <laughs> from taking technology and abusing it? Yeah. And I think the answer ultimately is that, um, and who should decide? How to handle these morons? Right. Is that is that a federal issue or is that a state and local so, thing? Um, so I think you know if we believe that the FAA has exclusive jurisdiction over the air, airspace, which um, we've just found out it does um, through the NTSB, um, then I think what we have to say is the that the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction and, and and that there should be some coordination with state and local uh, officials as well around what makes sense. But I don't think the knee jerk reaction should be to write redundant laws. I don't think it should be to say we need to panic to the extent where when someone acts in a fashion using technology for purposes it was not intended, that we need to overreact. That seems to be that which stifles technology, not that which allows it to prosper, and not that which allows good corporate citizens and good uh, citizens that are uh, availing themselves of the most incredible technology. Um, all it does is stifle innovation. And so what I've seen in the discussions with both recreational um, kind of hobbyist, civil, and commercial uh, potential operators is that their jobs and their focus is on how to do it safely and how what technology can be um, brought, into bear, brought to bear. I think the no-fly zone around D.C. is too big. I, I think what we, we're, we're going to the point where now we're saying because some drunk government employee, you know, totally mismanaged his drone and flew it over the White House fence that we got to be crazy, keep in mind it's the President of the United States that actually called, sitting President, called for the notice of proposed rulemaking to come out. I mean, how often do you hear of a sitting president calling for a notice of proposed rulemaking to come out because of the significant impact it will have on the economy? You never hear of it. And this is our president who wanted to see it happen, and the rule was supposed to be finalized on September 2015. It's not going to be. And I agreed. It's not – it's iterative. We're going to go through this time. But we shouldn't be at a point where Congress told them to come up with a rule and we're here now. And I think that, that's something that has to be addressed. So, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about legislation, but there's also already a lot of action that's being done by, you know, private companies to try and develop some kind of voluntary um, set of, you know, common behaviors, right? And so Amazon recently proposed, uh, you know, a – uh, setting aside a slice of um, of airspace for the use of commercial drones. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, Brian. Uh, last week we announced a, a proposal, and that is it is just that um, to uh, to segregate uh, low altitude airspace in a way that would separate uh, drone traffic from manned commercial or uh, private aircraft. Uh, the concept would be that uh, below 400 feet and above 200 feet would be sort of like a throughway where Drones could fly at relatively high speed. These are still slow compared to most aircraft. But uh, from place to place, it's a transit pathway. Below 200 feet would be reserved for local operations, takeoff and landing, or things like uh, you know, agricultural use or uh, inspections at low speed. Uh, and above 400 but below 500 feet, it would be a no-fly zone. And then above that is where uh, manned aircraft could fly. And the whole concept is by segregating the airspace this way, you just provide a degree of, of separation, a buffer, uh, so that the drones are not uh, intermingling as much as they uh, otherwise might with uh, manned aircraft. This works for uh, use cases at low altitudes. Obviously, the use cases that are at very high altitudes need to go through that uh, highly used um, airspace at higher altitudes, and different kinds of procedures would have to exist for them. But for the vast, mul uh, you know, majority of numbers of of drones, uh, they could all be flown very safely at these low altitudes. There also could be areas specified, almost the uh, uh, inverse of geofenced exclusionary zones, but inclusionary zones, which would be designated as as safe zones for flying for hobbyist purposes, recreational, other purposes. Uh, and those would be, again, away from uh, uh, congested airspace. Yeah, Lisa. Did you 
Did you yeah. have something? Oh, no, I was just going to add to what Paul said. Um, so Paul's proposal, uh, Amazon released its proposal last week at the NASA conference, and there was also just a lot of related conversation about that has come up in the space of airspace ownership generally. And in this context, the question has been, or there's this old concept called to he who owns his land owns the sky above, right? It makes a lot of sense. I own my backyard, don't I own to the heavens above? Well, in the general um, manned aircraft context, the Supreme Court has examined this question and has said, um, you know, there was a case called Cosby in 1946 where uh, a family had chicken, a bunch of chickens in their backyard and a military hair aircraft is flying very low to the ground over the um, chickens, killing the chickens, and that was 83 f feet above their property, and they, were set, they said that that was a taking, that was um, a violation of someone's own property. So kind of intertwined with this whole conversation as well is going to be homeowners, what, what exactly airspace above my property do I own such that um, it makes a lot of sense if I now want to be able to fly my own drone and take a picture of my house. 50 feet above the ground and put that picture up on the web in order to sell my house. Well, that's a commercial use and that's actually illegal, even though that is my property and that is, um, and I'm trying to just sell my own house um, as well. We're also talking, having this security conversation about how to keep others out of our backyards. And so kind of with this air traffic conversation is going to be a conversation as well about airspace ownership, which we're hearing a lot about across the country right now. Uh, you know, there's a great point about the Cosby case, and there's actually a case that goes back to the 1800s, which was uh, uh, Gil v. Swan, and it was Swan uh, was a guy who had a vegetable garden, and Gil was a balloonist, and went up in the air, and came crashing down, and dragged over the the, uh, the the vegetable garden, and then went into the barn and tore up the barn, and of course, you know, Gil was found guilty, but not of flying over the airspace of just destroying everything on the property when he actually crashed. Um, and I think, you know, one of the quotes that was uh, by a law professor, Timothy Ravitch, was something that was like, um, uh, fences make good neighbors, but you can't put fences in the air. Um, and I think one of the things that we should be thinking about in terms of this is education. Um, and this is one of the things that we've been talking a lot about at the Small UAV Coalition, which is uh, – it's our responsibility as uh, a coalition and as companies that have joined the coalition to help educate the public as to how to use this this equipment, this, this technology, these devices um, in a way that is commensurate with consumer expectations. I mean, the companies that are involved want it to succeed, and they want it to succeed because they care deeply both about the enjoyment and about the commercial opportunities that exist. So we launched a campaign called Know Before You Fly, and as a part of it, working with ethics in the House and Senate, we held a concert with OK Go. OK Go had gone to Japan to film a video, um, Won't Let You Down, where they were filming their video, and it's spectacular. If you haven't seen it, it's available on our website, um, but it's also available on theirs too. And so OK Go came, and 800 people came to this free concert. And it was a Know Before You Fly concert, and it was, here are the basics about what you have to do when you're going to be using a device either recreationally, and in the U.S., that's the only way you can do it, um, or get an exemption. The thing that's the most important is that you know, we were um, a much smaller crowd, but the Northern Border, Border Caucus was uh, uh, convened last week and it did an event where Transport Canada came. And they said, you know, you know, they were very respectful, but their basic point was we are trying to unleash this technology. We are not looking for So our period of time to turn around exemptions is 24 days, and we consider that too long. You know, our, our, the U.S. is three months and it typically goes over. Um, so their point is, we haven't had any problems. That, you know, and again, it's because people are, 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 are acting safely. But education is going to be a central part of all of this. And that's why all the companies are working together around the No Before You Fly campaign, other campaigns. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, AirMap, which joined the UAV coalition, the Small UAV Coalition, has a program, Drone Deploy. Others are working on how do we educate consumers around mapping and no-fly zones? How do we tell them how to effectively uh, use the technology? And I think that's going to be a big part of moving from this risk-based approach, moving incrementally to a place where we're going to see operations that everyone can feel comfortable about. Um, so I, I want to open it up to questions. It's a little bit uh, on the early side, but I want to – and at most of these types of events, I think, you know, I certainly have uh, 
takes a bit of time for me to sort of formulate and think about what I want to ask about. So I want to give you guys a chance to uh, to think um, first. But and I have a lot of questions left for you, so I'll maybe keep asking questions until uh, I see a question in the audience. But um, so one, you know, one thing I wanted to raise uh, is uh, the the privacy question. Um, you know, we were just talking about drones in your backyard, other people's drones uh, potentially in your yard. Uh, you know, I think last week we saw. Uh, you know, a case where there was a Kentucky man who shot down a drone that had crossed into his into his yard, and he was saying that that was trespassing, um, and that he was worried that you know the drone would be spying on uh, on his kids in his bedroom or whatnot. Um, you know, certainly, I think a lot of people in this room would be worried if a drone were to, um, uh, you know, even uh, in a neighboring yard, look into their home. Um, how you know what kinds of protections should there be or safeguards? Um, should uh, should there be to ensure that people aren't being spied on? Well, let me start by just saying, obviously, these are privacy questions, not drone questions, right? And so th these are the kinds of issues that need to be resolved, period, uh, with the introduction of new technologies, um, and uh, it ought to be looked at holistically. Uh, from a use case like ours, uh, it's going to be very easy to respect our customers and their neighbors' privacy. It's just that we don't have a need for surveillance uh, no cameras and business. whatnot. Well, there, there's got to be a navigation equipment of some sort, mm -hmm. and uh, TBD, what all that is, what, what is actually on the drone to make it safe. Um, but uh, there are other use cases which are obviously more problematic. Uh, you know, where's the dividing line between news gathering and uh, voyeurism? Um, those, are, those are challenging ones more broadly. I think for commercial operations, it's going to be fairly easy to uh, – to address privacy concerns, but it's incumbent upon us to make uh, consumers, our customers, uh, but also other people uh, just as uh, comfortable with the technology as, as we've become with it. Um, just building on what uh, Paul just said, so it's t just taking a step back here because we do here in tons of communities across the country, what we're seeing from the states and localities is a lot of concern about privacy issues. The safety issues are out there. People are really, really concerned about privacy in particular. Um, and just taking a step back here, uh, you know, drones are a platform for a camera, right? So our helicopters or our cell phones, so our pole cameras, um, and there is an array of privacy laws and rules on the books that do already protect us. And so part of this is, is Paul just mentioned, maybe perhaps doing a public education campaign with the public about what about the fact that there are a, a huge long list of privacy rules and laws that that do protect us um, because it is true that even though drones are just a platform for a camera for some reason or another perhaps it's because the word drone connotes you know drones flying overseas gathering intelligence they have the same name they're nothing alike um, whatever the case may be um, for some reason the American people do perceive drones differently so there was a, an interesting study out of the University of Oklahoma that studied people's reactions to ground based cameras versus drone based cameras capturing the exact same information the exact same photos and footage um, and people had a very negative reaction to the idea of drone based cameras capturing that exact information that same information versus the same information to monitor traffic for example from a ground based camera so it's something that we as an industry we all um, have to recognize and deal with there is going to be um, an, uh, in the, the same day that the proposed rule was released on February 15th, the White House also released a presidential memorandum recognizing, um, well, first of all, laying out the rules of the road for the federal government agencies that are using drones, and um, including limitations on privacy, transparency, accountability, and civil rights and civil liberties in the government's use of drones, and then as well setting up a multi-stakeholder process that will be run through the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, at the Department of Commerce, which actually starts today in about 15 minutes. Um, uh, today will be the first meeting of this NTIA stakeholder process, where many folks from industry will come together with government and civil society organizations and universities and have a conversation about privacy um, in order there is a lot of room for consensus on this issue and so um, and talk about are do drones present unique privacy concerns if so what are those if not perhaps maybe our general privacy laws as a society just need to be updated and that will take care of a lot of our concerns um, so this is definitely it's just something that that we see a lot in popular culture do any of you watch modern family okay there was recently a, an episode of modern family that was all about a drone spying on a family in their backyard above the swimming pool 
and the, the husband was trying to swat the drone out of the sky, and uh, his swimming trunks fell down. Of course, the, the drone got footage of that incident, sped off, and the next day on YouTube, there was a video called Drone One, Idiot Nothing. Um, and you know, this is, this is what the American people are watching. This is what's being, being seen in popular culture. And so um, you know, it's definitely something where all responsible partners in the industry un will only be uh, flying drones in a way that is protective of, of people's privacy. It's just a, a conversation that we need to have so that folks understand that there are the rules of the road that are in place. Um, before I, yeah, there's a question back there. Could you introduce yourself and stand up, please? Thanks, Grace, very much. Um, so the question we had to do with uh, what are we doing in, in, as an industry and maybe as a company specifically to address cybersecurity and uh, hacking concerns, uh, we're, we're aware. I mean, we've from the, our very beginning, our roots uh, 20 years ago, we've been a security company. It's been part of our, our culture, um, and uh, we've had technological solutions all, all along, and we're going to have one for this one too. Uh, it is interesting that there's this – there's this tension, it seems to exist, between those who really, really, really want a person to be always in control of the thing. And, um, and if that's the case, then the, the communications link is paramount. Uh, but if they're highly automated, the thing can be smart enough to avoid uh, the kinds of concerns you're suggesting. Uh, but that means that we have to be able to accept the, uh, the notion of, of technology providing that kind of a barrier and that level of autonomy um, in each of the vehicles. So um, I, I can tell you from Amazon's perspective, we're on it. Mm -hmm. So traffic concerns in the air, how do you deal with that? Oh, I thought it was pollen and allergies. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the question did go to congestion. Um, the, uh, Callie, you're right that it presents challenges, but that's what managing the airspace is all about. And if these things know how to sense and avoid other things, uh, it'll all work. And what we're trying to uh, develop is a set of rules that recognize that more sophisticated kinds of drones can be able to detect and avoid anything, uh, including other drones, uh, manned aircraft. Uh, and the hardest things to deal with are the ones that don't talk, that, that just fly by themselves. And avoiding those is a challenge, but it's not an insurmountable one. Um, obviously, congestion is harder than no congestion. It's easier to fly in Montana than it is in New York City. Uh, but that said, it doesn't mean that you know both use cases are, or one or the other is possible or not. They, they're addressable. Uh, and it may be with different technology sets. It may be even with different kinds of vehicles flying in city uh, environments as opposed to rural environments. You can imagine that in a city environment, you never have to fly very far. Uh, in a rural environment, that might mean that you need greater battery life. You have to optimize around that. Uh, maneuverability might be at a premium in a city as, a, as opposed to in, in Montana. So uh, these kinds of trade-offs are things that, you know, aeronautical engineers face every day, and uh, we're, again, we're on it. It sounds, it's cliched, I get it, but uh, the, the, the notion that we have to keep uh, uh, the, the, the traffic levels low is not realistic, nor is it um, helpful for the deployment of technology and all the, uh, the consumer benefits that it will bring. So a, a quick follow-up question to that. Uh, Michael, yeah. I just want to jump in on, on th those are two great questions um, that we just had about sensitive way technology and cybersecurity. And I think what's great about the efforts of everyone here, um, at least within the community, is that you know, we're not only working with the FTC, but we're working with the FCC. Um, we're working with uh, DHS. We're working with DOT. We're working with Department of Commerce. We have what is, uh, I think, um, 
in, in my estimation, one of the most um, kind of uh, revolutionary technology that spans so many different areas of the of the U.S. government. So we are working with DOT and FAA as well. Don't leave them out. Um, um, but I would say that um, what Congress's role is here is great it's because it is such a multidisciplinary approach that has to be taken. What's been great about DHS and DOD and FCC and FTC is there has been a willingness to say, we just don't know, actually. We're not yet clear. But we know we have to move fast because we know that the actors involved in this want to do it right. And so this has been a very productive dialogue, I would say. Um, and I think, you know, my hope is that we do something that right away, um, within the FAA reauthorization, provided that it gets done, we get uh, a micro rule um, on its way, as well as pathways to greater exploration of commercial use um, for larger vehicles. And all of that would be done with a, a, a prerequisite, which is that we can do it safely. And, and, and you know, I am confident that every company, both the, the kind of civil, commercial, and recreational companies, that they are going to do this and help to ensure that this is done safely. Um, someone asked a question of me when I was out at the same UTM conference. They said, you know, how did you get here? You know, I said, well, by plane. And they said, well, yeah, but, uh, who operated the plane? You know, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a dummy. I'm like, the pilot. <laughs> and the person looks at me and says, no. The pilot basically watched automation and made sure that it was working. And then when there was turbulence, the automation took control and he's like, when you're sitting in your seat comfortably, you know, thinking about what you're going to do when you land, automation is flying your plane. And then it lands your plane. And, and then, I, then I said, yeah, I represent the Small UAV Coalition. And they're like, you know, dummy. You know, but it was, a, it was a wonderful conversation to have because we assume right away that this is something just totally new. When in reality, all of these things have had to be considered within every industry. It's just we're in an industry now where people are saying, Oh my God, it's all new and it's scary. It's not new, it's not scary, and we can do it, and we can do it quickly. So last, last week, or maybe it was the week before, um, Bloomberg had an article about how Google is you know, developing efforts to try and um, you know, do uh, air traffic control for, for drones. Um, I'm kind of curious, you know, how, how much coordination is there between, um, say, Amazon and Google or you know, between others in the industry who are trying to develop these solutions? Um, is this a, you know, Google doing its own thing and then Amazon doing its other thing? And, uh, and how much coordination is there? We talk uh, frequently, um, and they have some ideas that they also presented out at the UTM conference like we did, uh, and they're complementary. Uh, I think we're, we're all – we share this desire. We uh, – the handful of companies that have, are really focused on the airspace, we share this desire to make sure that it works. It, if it doesn't work for everybody, it works for nobody. Uh, and so what we're trying to figure out is a way to, to manage that airspace. Obviously, there has to be government involvement. Ours are merely proposals. We're not policymakers. You guys are. Uh, so it's a, it's a cooperative relationship with, uh, with Google and many other players, including members of Michael's coalition. And uh, the FAA is currently working on NextGen, which is sort of the its next generation of, of um, you know, in, how its vision of the airspace is going to work. How does something like what you're working on um, with industry going to fit in with all of that? So, thanks, Brian. There are technologies that have been developed for non-drone uses that have application within drones. And one of the areas of your expertise, Brian, in, in your, in your uh, journalism is with respect to telecommunications. Uh, there are uh, different kinds of telecommunications technologies that can be deployed in different circumstances for drone operations. And uh, it's, it's not a question of which one. It's, which, it's more like which one's plural. And it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all thing. Uh, there are lots of opportunities, for example, for using commercial, existing commercial uh, land mobile spectrum for various kinds of communications links. There are also um, kinds of identification technologies that allow, would allow drones to show up very clearly and be recognizable by others. Um, all these kinds of technologies will be coming together, and, and NextGen is just is one component of it. Obviously, it's a very important component, but... Uh, um, you know, it's next gen and other things as well. I think we had a question in the front here. I have a particular question about tracking. As you look at apps as flight plans, has the city applied for using the drone not for public safety but for sidewalk generation, mm -hmm. for traffic, Amazon? 
so far is city dwellings over the sidewalk so the heart city and also we plan on the sidewalk path are there anything of that nature so the question is about uh, how cities could use drones. Smart cities. Smart cities, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, we don't want to serve dumb cities. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. So I, th I think there's, there are many opportunities like that. I think these are the kinds of things, great idea. I mean, I hadn't thought about sidewalk cracks. Um, but, uh, I mean, there are multiple applications. When you start going around and you're flying around and you're noticing things, you can notice a lot of things if you intend to. Uh, but, you know, this is kind of the flip side of the privacy um, concern. You don't want to be noticing things that you shouldn't notice. And so uh, there is there's room for this. I, th I think, you know, obviously things like weather, uh, you know, weather forecasting, that's kind of a cool way to think about, well, what if you have a lot of vehicles flying about at different altitudes and different locations? Maybe they could also be kind of checking out what the weather is and feeding into a larger systems. Uh, you know, just couple of examples of applications. So um, I will think about smart cities and, and, uh, and you know, repair opportunities, let's call them. <laughs> uh, there are, I think this city has at least two or three potholes. I could probably. <laughs> 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 yeah. I think we had another question yeah, in the back. Uh, so the, the question is about, you know, drone regulations and whether or not, um, you know, certain states could be friendlier to drones than others. And it seems like we kind of touched on it a little bit uh, earlier with uh, Michael's comments on federal jurisdiction, but uh, if we could sort of address, um, address it more broadly, that'd be great. Sure. So I'll just take a first step. So, um, you know, companies love drones. They can't wait to be able to use them, just like your question suggests. Can't wait to be able to use them for their own purposes, but they also are concerned about the other's use of drones. The other's use of drones, for example, if you're an oil refinery, having drones fly over your property, a power plant, uh, a theme park. Um, there are a lot of concerns both from people and also companies about other others' drones flying over their property. Now, as Michael mentioned, it's in terms of jurisdiction, the FAA has jurisdiction over maintaining the safety and security of our national airspace. They would say that means the blade of grass up is under their jurisdiction in terms of safety and operations. However, states have traditionally uh, regulated privacy, and so that's where we see all of these uh, state proposed, all this proposed legislation in localities across the country are proposing laws that would limit the use of drones in some way, generally based on privacy concerns. Um, a lot of times it's to limit their own law enforcement use of drones, but sometimes it does touch on private use of drones as well. And um, I think that we are on the privacy side. You know, the federal government has traditionally, with, with some exceptions, left privacy alone to the states, and so we're going to see a, a bit of a patchwork. Um, but, of course, there are a lot of concerns about that as well because the patchwork is very difficult for companies that fly in many states. And so um, there, there is a tension there. I would just say that um, I would love to get my tacos delivered by a drone, so uh, <laughs> count me in. I'd also say that your question actually, is, I think, is, is, is deeper than the answer we're giving. Um, you're saying, are we proposing to liberalize without restricting at all? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, I don't think anybody on this panel, nor do I think any of the members of the coalition or um, others would say that the companies are simply looking to have free reign to do whatever they want. Um, I think everyone is sensitive to the fact that we are working with technology that is, um, that is kind of a, a green field that needs to have some rules. Now, the neighbors of yours have shotguns that want to shoot it out. That's a totally different discussion that needs to be handled by the medical community because they can't do that. They can't shoot the drone out of the sky. That's a little, there's, a little, there's a lot going on there. Um, but I would say this. It's absolutely the case that rules that are going to be proposed are going to be there to protect consumers, but they're also going to be there to allow for innovation. So I think it's a nice mix. Let's take one last question.
Killer drones. Are they going to become a thing? <laughs> well, all technology can be used for good and for bad, and that's not unique to drones, unfortunately. There are going to be people who want to use the technology in the wrong way. Um, an armed drone that is shooting uh, is obviously um, – there are several laws that are being violated there, and so <laughs> um, part of it is about enforcing the laws that we have on the books. And of course, if you're using a drone in furtherance of a terrorist operation, then that is that is a, a violation of many laws right there. You know, one of the things I, I like to point out is that, that and, and I know that um, people here are, are supportive um, and on the panel, but I've heard for years the lawmakers come to the floor and, and speak in, in committee meetings about how this is such great technology to be used overseas in areas where we can save military uh, personnel's lives. Because it's so targeted, because it's, there's no collateral damage, because it's so precise, and yet those same lawmakers, some of them are standing up now and saying we can't have them in the U.S. because it's, it's on so unclear and there's, they're not precise. And I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a second. When they were when they were advising, we used them in, in some foreign incursion, and they said they were totally safe and there wouldn't be any collateral damage, and, and they and they went on and on about the technology. How can they now be completely abandoning that position? If they weren't safe then, why are we using them so much and increasingly so overseas? My view is that they must be safe since we're using them overseas, overseas and therefore let's start using them at home. If I may, Brian, I'd just like to maybe close out with a, uh, uh, with a suggestion. Uh, you all have very important jobs in federal policymaking. It seems to me that drone flights in the United States are very clearly a matter of interstate commerce. This is your purview. Congress has plenary authority over interstate commerce, always has, and it needs to be used. Um, we can't have that patchwork. We really can't. It's, it's not going to serve consumers ultimately, uh, and you have the opportunity to set policy. I, inv I invite you to get in early uh, on all these conversations. The one that needs to be had right now as soon as possible is this flying beyond visual line of sight with highly aut automated uh, technology. Uh, those questions just simply are not being addressed enough in the United States, and they be are being addressed overseas. And so to the extent that Congress can prod, either in oversight or in legislation, the uh, relevant agencies, and there are multiple, uh, to get the job done here, uh, you, will have, you will have done a great service to the country. Thank you. Lisa, anything else you want to add before we let you all go? Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for having us, first of all. I think it's really important to talk, to have a public conversation about the benefits of UAS as well as, of course, all the security and privacy risks. Um, nobody in the industry wants to go about this in a way that is not safe, that is not respective of, of people's privacy, and it's important to have a very public conversation about, about the benefits. Drones are here. They're here to stay, and, um, you know, I think together uh, policymakers and innovators can craft a way forward, um, and so thank you for hosting us today. Well, that's all the time we've got. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I think we'll be sticking around here for a few minutes uh, afterward if you want to come chat, but otherwise, uh, appreciate it and have a